Oh, here so, you go. Okay. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, my colleague, friend, and long-term collaborator, Dr. Heide Ford. Uh, so Heide got her PhD from uh, University of Rochester. And uh, after a postdoc at uh, Dana Faber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School, she uh, became a faculty on our campus and has been here since. So uh, Haida and uh, her lab were the first to discover the abnormal uh, overexpression of 6-1 uh, uh, homeobox uh, transcription factor and developmental gene in various cancers. And uh, her lab has uh, since been, uh, has since devoted to understand uh, the parallel between normal development and cancer, uh, as well as the numerous molecular mechanism of 6-1 and uh, its coactivator IA um, in inducing tumor genesis and metastasis. So her lab um, has uh, really published uh, extensively on the topics and uh, she's truly a founder and the leader of the field. And so today I think we're going to hear from her um, some uh, new ways of uh, inhibit metastasis uh, by targeting 6-1 mediated uh, tumor heterogeneity and EMT. All right, hi. Okay, I think I'm going to turn this off because I'll probably walk around so I can see that. So thanks, Ray, for the introduction. Um, I asked Ray to introduce me today because, as she mentioned, we've been uh, long-term... Whoa, this is loud. Um, is there a way to turn that down? Okay. Um, let's, maybe I'll move it further. We've been long-term um, collaborators. So now can everyone hear me in the back? Yes? Okay, we've been long-term collaborators. I, I think maybe even for as almost 15 years. It's been a long time that we've been working together. Um, and I was asked to speak in the Cancer Center today to speak specifically about some of our drug development work. And the reason for that is that we recently had a visit from um, David Ver Verschup, who's at um, the uh, Duke University at Singapore, but he's also interacting a lot with a group called ASTAR in Singapore, which is an, an um, experimental therapeutics center, which I'm going to talk about a little bit towards the end, that's really interested in taking academic findings and academic interests and moving them all the way from uh, a very early stage drug development into the clinic. And they actually, David Verschup, who was here, um, he didn't speak this time around, but he's been here before, is one of their first people who took a compound, it's a porcupine inhibitor, um, all the way from, again, very basic science into the clinic. And so um, I'm only going to talk about the drug development stuff at the back, at le the back half of this because I want to give you some of the idea of the biology behind this. But then I will talk a little bit about what we've done with these groups. And then if anybody's interested, uh, let me know. Drop me an email because, again, they came here with the idea that they'd like to um, forge more collaborations here at the University of Colorado to do the same kind of things that Ray and I have been doing with them. Okay. So like Ray mentioned, my lab is very interested in the parallels between normal development and tumor genesis. In particular, we work quite a bit with a process that happens during normal embryonic development called the epithelial to mesenchymal transition. And many of you know that that transition occurs during numerous stages of development, including uh, one main aspect that's often studied for EMT is neural crest migration. So these cells are epithelial cells that start here around the neural tube, and then they migrate out um, after they undergo an EMT to become um, different parts of the embryo. And what we know, and we've known for many, many years, is a similar process is hijacked by epithelial tumor cells um, during the progression of cancers. And so what's been thought for many years is that, um, this doesn't really work very well, but um, that this process, EMT, occurs. So if you have an epithelial tumor, it doesn't really work at all. Huh. Okay. Maybe I'll try to, it might be easier anyway, to try to use, except that I can't see my cursor. Oh, you guys can and I can't. Yeah, that's not going to work. Okay, um, I'll try to see if this works. But anyway, what happens during normal, uh, or sorry, during cancer progression is that a subset of cells within an epithelial tumor, so let's say a breast cancer, for example, which is something we study, um, undergoes this epithelial to mesenchymal transition, and those cells are thought to be the ones, wow, this is really terrible. Does anybody else have a pointer? Uh, thanks, Ray. Um, on the side? Oh, uh, I think so, yep. No? Nope. Uh, hold on. This one? No? Nope. 
Okay, maybe I'll just gesticulate a lot or something. Uh, I'm pretty good at that, actually. So anyway, what happens is a subset of cells within the tumor are thought to, or are actually known to undergo an epithelial mesenchymal transition, and it's those cells that are actually thought to migrate away from the primary tumor and be the ones that metastasize. So they migrate into the bloodstream, they can invade into the bloodstream, and then get to secondary sites. And so for many years, many groups have been studying the role of developmental regulators in this process. Um, and, and like Ray said, our lab studies quite a bit of transcription factor called 6-1. But there are other major transcription factors involved in EMT, such as many of you have probably heard of snail, slug, and twist. And those transcription factors, along with signaling molecules and receptors, are again thought to get re-expressed after development is complete um, in, a, in a cancerous setting and then contribute to uh, the migration and invasion of these cells and therefore metastasis. <clears throat> okay, so. Years ago when we started studying this, we were really interested in the idea that these could be potentially very good therapeutic targets because, again, they're not expressed after a lot of them, a number of them, are not expressed after development is complete, but then they get turned back on as epithelial tumor cells get more aggressive and more migratory and invasive. And so, uh, again, along with Ray, we have been studying ways to target these. But a few years ago, a study came out um, arguing that EMT was actually not important for metastasis. And so this is uh, this paper. There were actually two back-to-back -back papers published in Nature that said this. Uh, and we were really surprised because there are thousands of papers in the literature that link EMT and EMT-inducing transcription factors to metastatic phenotypes. And there's a lot of papers in the literature that link them to the progression of disease. Um, and so we thought, well, you know, maybe there, there are a number of reasons. So this study was done by fate mapping the cells that had undergone an EMT. Ooh, wow, that was fast. Ah, oh, that one's great. Thank you. Okay, so this study was done by fate mapping the cells that had undergone an EMT. So once they went, became more mesenchymal, they were permanently marked. And what these authors saw is so their GFP, let's say. And what these authors noticed is that those permanently marked cells that had undergone an EMT were actually never located at the secondary site. And therefore, their assumption was that EMT is not required for metastasis. Um, <clears throat> And so, again, historically, the idea was that if you undergo an EMT, so if cells express in a, an epithelial tumor express uh, transcription factors like twist and snail, uh, those particular cells will become more mesenchymal-like, and it's those cells that then secrete proteases, become more invasive, et cetera, and get into the bloodstream. And one of the thoughts we had was that perhaps one of the reasons when they fate mapped the cells, they never actually found the EMT cells at the secondary site was because they weren't looking at the neighboring cells. So maybe those cells that underwent an EMT were actually in some way influencing their neighbors and that allowing those cells to now metastasize, even though they didn't look more mesenchymal. So um, what we hypothesized, and this is work largely done by uh, Deepika Neil Compton in my lab, but also Hung Bo Zhao, both graduate students, was that in your primary tumor, you might have some cells that are just your regular epithelial tumor cells that have not undergone an EMT. You might have another subset of cells that are expressing a twist or snail. Those are your EMT cells. And then what might happen is that they may do something to these neighboring cells. So it's not just passive, meaning that these cells, you could argue, right, that these EMT cells are degrading the matrix and just allowing these cells to escape. escape. But what we argued is these cells are probably actually doing something to the other cells to make them more mesenchymal, just by, or not, not necessarily mesenchymal, sorry, more migratory and invasive, just by virtue of the fact that there are heterogeneous tumors and that some EMT cells will exist um, next to ones that are not EMT. So some of the earlier experiments done were done by Hungbo, again, a graduate student in the lab, and what he did was just take um, epithelial, these are HMLER cells, so these are human memory epithelial cells that are transformed um, and are actually um, tumorigenic but non-metastatic, and either express snail or twist in these cells. And what you can see is if you just look at the cells on their own, hopefully you can appreciate this, the snail expressing and the twist expressing cells can migrate into this wound quite effectively, but these cells that don't express twist or snail do not. And I should say it was already known from work by Bob Weinberg that these snail and twist expressing cells were metastatic in vivo. So what Hongbo did was he co-cultured the snail expressing or the twist expressing cells with the cells that were non-metastatic and, and non -E had not gone through an EMT. And what you hopefully can appreciate here 
is not only are the red cells or the metastatic cells migrating, but so are the green ones that are, that are associated with these cells or, or co-cultured co with them, whereas here they weren't migrating at all. And so again, that suggested that the cells that had undergone an EMT can actually influence the neighboring cells. This is just quantitation of the, that. Um, he's just quantitated here the movement of the green cells only. So that's the non-metastatic cells. And again, hopefully you can appreciate if they're co-cultured, even when you only have one out of 10 cells that have undergone an EMT, which is more, you know, in, a, in an actual human tumor, you usually don't see more than 10% of the cells having undergone an EMT. You still have this effect on migration such that the non-migratory and non-metastatic cells are able to move more. All right. <clears throat> so what we wanted to figure out was sort of mechanistically how that works. Um, and so what Deepika started doing was trying to figure that out using um, experiments first to just see whether this, whatever was influencing the non-metastatic cells was actually something in the conditioned media, so something secreted from the more metastatic cells. And so what she did was a really simple experiment. She just took her metastatic, so these are the EMT cells, took the conditioned media off of those, and then co-cultured, or, or sorry, not co-cultured, added the conditioned media to her non-metastatic cells, and then asked what happens to these cells when you look at a number of different parameters associated with um, metastasis. And so what she found was that, um, indeed, if you just took the conditioned media off of the cells that were, had undergone an EMT, whether that was induced by snail or by twist, um, and you put that conditioned media that's in red here on the control cells that were non-metastatic and had not undergone an EMT, you could dramatically inhibit their migration. This was true both if you use conditioned media from twist or snail cells. <clears throat> um, and the same is true for invasion um, also. So it wasn't just migration. You could impart a number of metastatic phenotypes on the HMLER cells if you did this. And I should mention also that these cells the cells that get the conditioned media from the cells that have undergone an EMT, in this case, did not convert to look more mesenchymal. So the migration and invasion could be dissociated from the markers that you might use to look at whether these cells are more mesenchymal, which was interesting to us, because that would again suggest that you could miss this by fate mapping approaches. All right, so um, again, we wanted to figure out mechanistically how this crosstalk might be working. And so, as Ray mentioned, we've been working with 6-1 for many years in our lab. And EMT-inducing transcription factors are known to exist in these really complex webs, or web, and they all seem to um, interact with each other. And so 6-1 had already been shown to be upstream of a major EMT factor, ZEB1 and ZEB2. And so we were curious whether 6-1 was anywhere in the same pathway with the twist and snail um, induction of EMT. So, I think probably so many of you know this background because you've either been on my students' thesis committees or heard me talk, or, but just for those of you, of you who haven't. So what is 6-1? So um, as Ray mentioned at the beginning, it belongs to a family of homeobox proteins. Uh, these are transcription factors that are highly conserved and um, very critical for in embryonic development. So they're, again, expressed in very early embryogenesis, and they're involved in a lot of early embryonic processes, like expansion of progenitor cell populations, migration, invasion, EMT during development. Um, and they tend to get turned off after development is complete. Um, they have a very conserved DNA binding domain. I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that 6-1 has no intrinsic um, activation or repression domain a bit later. Um, and they're associated with a number of human diseases. So you can imagine, since they're critical in embryogenesis, if they're mutated, they lead to a number of different genetic syndromes. They're also known to be overexpressed in cancers. Um, and on this next slide is just the many different tumor types in which they've been shown to be overexpressed. Um, and in most of those cancers, no one's been able to find mutations. So it looks what like what happens is it just gets re-expressed out of context. So now you have this developmental transcription factor expressed, wrong place, wrong time. But there, are, there were two back-to-back -back papers in cancer cell a couple years ago that showed that both 6-1 and a closely related family member 6-2 actually have gain-of-function mutations in Wilms tumor. And more recently, those mutations have been shown to be critical for increasing the glycolytic phenotype. So they're important for metabolic effects that we've never actually even looked at. OK. <clears throat> so a little more background about 6-1. We knew previously that in a cell-autonomous manner, 
6-1 can induce metastasis. So if you take MCF7 cells, which are mammary carcinoma cells or breast cancer cells that are non-metastatic in general, um, and add in 6-1 and inject them into mice either orthotopically, so in the mammary gland or in the tail vein, to look at late stage metastasis, what happens is the cells that express 6-1 are highly, much more metastatic than those that, those that don't. And obviously the, the mice survive uh, much worse if 6-1 is overexpressed. And the flip side of that is also true. If you take breast cancer cells, in this case these are mammary carcinoma cells, uh, they're mouse mammary carcinoma cells that express high levels of 6-1 endogenously, and you knock down 6-1, what you can hopefully appreciate, this is an orthotopic model, so these are primary tumors here, is that the metastasis pretty dramatically decreases when 6-1 was knocked down. And we could show that even better because in this particular model, um, the cells that we put into the mice were 6-thioguani resistant. So to prove that the lungs, the, the metastatic burden in the lungs was really different because we had so much signal from the IVUS, we took the lungs out, minced them up, and then plated them in the presence of 6-thioguani. And the only cells that will survive will be tumor cells, not the normal lung cells. And so you can see here, if you don't knock down 6-1, there are tons of cells in the lungs, tumor cells. But with 6-1 knocked down, it's dramatically diminished. So these data suggested to us that 6-1 is um, really necessary and sufficient to uh, affect metastasis in these models, at least. Okay, so let's go back to the model with snail one and twist one. So um, we looked to see whether 6-1 might be induced downstream of twister snail, and actually to our surprise, it was pretty highly induced. So if you look at this plot, these are our control uh, non-metastatic, non-EMT cells. These are cells overexpressing snail, and these are cells overexpressing twist. And what you can hopefully appreciate is there's a huge increase in 6-1 levels in the presence of snail or twist suggesting that those two EMT transcription factors can induce 6-1. We then also knocked down 6-1 in the context of snail or twist and took the condition media from these cells and then transferred it. So what we wanted to know is, are the phenotypes that are non-cell autonomous, so is this paracrine, paracrine signaling mechanism that makes neighboring cells more metastatic or more, have more metastatic properties, I should say, are they dependent on 6-1 downstream of snail, snail and twist? And what we could show here is that, again, if you grow the snail cells in their own media, they're very migratory. If you grow the control cells in their own media, they're less migratory. If you take snail condition media that where 6-1 is knocked down, not knocked down, again, they're very migratory. If you knock down 6-1 downstream of snail, then take the condition media and treat these cells, they don't migrate as well. Suggesting that 6-1 is a main player downstream of twist and snail. Sorry, I didn't show you twist, but it's exactly the same thing. Same thing holds for invasion and other phenotypes that we checked. So that, that showed us that 6-1 was a critical player downstream of twist and snail um, to mediate some of these phenotypes. Okay, so we wanted to know if, going back to our MCF7 model where we could put in 6-1 and make those cells metastatic, we wanted to know if, so I just showed you it was necessary downstream of twist and snail, so we wanted to know if it was also sufficient to induce more aggressive properties. So in this case, what we did was we took our MCF7 model that I already showed you was metastatic um, in a cell autonomous manner, and we took, again, condition media off of those cells and treated our control cells with that condition media. And in this case, we actually had a conversion of the non-EMT cells to a more EMT phenotype. So you can see here that genes like fibronectin, uh, were, or protein, sorry, this is a Western, were upregulated in response to 6-1 condition media. Cytokeratin 18, which is an epithelial protein, was downregulated. Um, similarly, if we look at E. cadherin on the surface of the cells, which is a, an indicator of a more epithelial like phenotype, you can see that if we grow the cells in their own control media, they have a lot of epithelial E. cadherin. But if we put in 6 1, that's dramatically downregulated. 6 1 condition media, sorry, from 6 1 cells. And then if we look at phenotypes like anoikis, this comes up. Similar things happen. If you take uh, control cells in their own media, they, are, um, they die uh, pretty, uh, quite a bit in response to being uh, suspended. If you take 6-1 media and put it on the control cells, you rescue that phenotype. So again, while the, while the outputs of the phenotypes were slightly different between the different models, all of the models show that 
something that 6.1 was making was actually leading to something in the condition media that was then changing the property of cells that were in the vicinity. And so that's what we wanted to understand. All right, so I'm not gonna go through all the things we did to try to figure that out, because we did a lot of um, unbiased approaches, and none of them worked. And then we um, went to a talk from a Drosophila geneticist, which I have to say, this is how like, good it is to go to talks that have nothing to do with your field. So he was studying eye development, and he gave a talk here at the university, and I went to his talk, and he started talking about how 6-1, or the Drosophila version of 6-1, was upstream of hedgehog. Um, and this got me thinking, geez, hedgehog is a secreted molecule, and it could induce some of these phenotypes. So we should go back and look at this in our mammalian systems. And so we did that. Oh, so sorry. Let me go through the pathway a little bit, because I'm going to have to show some of the outputs of the pathway. So many of you probably know that um, hedgehog is a secreted ligand that when it binds to the patch receptor on cells, actually um, relieves patch-mediated repression of this protein called smoothened that then signals um, into the cell, ultimately, and I'm not going to go through all the steps, but ultimately resulting in the activation of these proteins called GLE transcription factors that bind to DNA and then activate the transcription of a lot of genes involved in things that might be important in early embryogenesis and could also promote tumor progression. So we saw this talk, and Deepika went to back to the lab and thought, well, let me look if sonic hedgehog, which is the mammalian version of hedgehog, is actually upregulated in response to 6-1. So what we saw, we were a little bit surprised by. So if we looked at the MCF7 system, 6-1 um, was dramatically upregulated, sorry, sonic hedgehog was dramatically upregulated by the presence of 6-1. So that fit our hypothesis, and we thought, oh, wow, okay. This is going to be, um, this is ELISA, so we can see way more of it secreted in the media. And we thought, well, there's our answer. Maybe sonic hedgehog is mediating all these phenotypes. All right. Um, but to our surprise, we did not see really any sonic hedgehog in the media of the snail or the twist cells. This was actually undetectable levels. And we couldn't find any of the other hedgehog ligands in that context either. We couldn't find desert hedgehog. We couldn't find Indian hedgehog. There was no evidence of hedgehog mediating these phenotypes in the other systems where we knew 6-1 was mediating our phenotypes. Um, and at that point, I'm glad we just didn't give up and say hedgehog signaling isn't the, the final thing, because then we thought, well, you know, hedgehog uh, signaling can be activated in both um, canonical and non-canonical ways. And so maybe the end result is that we activate hedgehog signaling in the neighboring cells in all cases but it doesn't necessarily work through the canonical ligands. And so what we did is um, we collaborated with Mike Lewis, who's at Baylor College of Medicine and is a real expert in hedgehog signaling, and we got a reporter that was a, it basically has seven glee binding sites in it. Remember I told you glee is the very downstream component of the hedgehog signaling pathway. Um, and this reporter was a GFP reporter, so we could look to see if glee was activated. And of course, not to our surprise, if we looked at cells expressing 6-1, uh, sorry, this was media from cells expressing 6-1 that's put on the control cells, we had a huge increase in this glee reporter. Again, that wasn't a big surprise because there's a lot of sonic hedgehog in the media when you have 6-1. And if we looked at a number of transcriptional targets of glee just to make sure endogenously uh, hedgehog signaling was activated, we could see that um, a number of targets, including glee itself, so it activates itself, patch, the repressor, which is a negative feedback loop, is activated, as well as a number of other targets of that signaling pathway. So the surprise came with the um, HMLER system, so the other breast cancer system with twist and snail. So in both cases, you can see that we, in the presence of media from snail or from twist, we had dramatic activation of glee signaling in response to that media. And if we took media off of cells where we knocked down 6-1, that response was attenuated. So what that suggested to us is yes, Somehow, hedgehog signaling is activated in all contexts in response to 6-1, but it's not necessarily through a canonical mechanism in all cases. Um, I'm sorry, these are some of the, this is just patch, but we, ooh, it's not up there. Oh, God. This is just patch downstream, again, an endogenous target by real-time PCR. We looked at a number of targets. Same thing is true. Um, <laughs> and just as an aside, this makes publishing your papers really hard 
because the system is not working exactly the same in every system. And when we first tried to submit this paper, we admitted that, and they got all upset that it's not the same in all systems, and I, which is very frustrating because biology is biology. And, and what we were trying to point out was it doesn't matter if it's not the same. As long as glee is activated in the non-EMT cells in response to the EMT cells in all cases, we can figure out how to target that. But reviewers didn't go for that for a bit. Um, we did finally get it published, actually. Uh, but anyway, so, so um, to go back to this pathway, there are a number of different inhibitors of hedgehog signaling that we could use to see whether what we're seeing is actually the case. So there are upstream inhibitors that target um, either the ligand itself or uh, smoothin, cyclopamine, and 5E1. And then there's a downstream inhibitor called, is it's not coming up, called GANT61, which specifically targets the glee transcription factor. So by using these inhibitors, we could figure out what the dominant mechanism of action was with this crosstalk between the different cell types and what we should go after again if we think about how to use this in a, in a more clinical setting, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, okay, so, um, so we use these inhibitors in our systems and actually completely as anticipated, if we use our reporter for glee, Putting media on from 6-1 cells, again, activates that. And if you use the hedgehog inhibitor, the smoothened inhibitor, or the downstream glee inhibitor, all three of them break that effect. And again, you might expect that because you've got sonic hedgehog in the media here. Um, in contrast, when we did this in the snail and twist systems, what ended up happening was if we used cyclopamine, we didn't even try 5E1 because, again, it binds to the ligands. There were no ligands present. So if you lose cyclopamine, which targets um, smooth ends, you don't have any effects. But if you use GAN61, again, the very downstream inhibitor, then you can affect um, activation of this pathway. Similarly, we could inhibit all of the crosstalk between the cells by adding in the glee inhibitor, GAN61. So, so if we added in the inhibitor and tested migration as well as invasion, Again, you can see media with snail or twist induces that. If you then add in GAN61 to that media, you completely repress that. Same is true of invasion, and that's in the HMLER systems. And then we could do similar um, things in the MCF7 system. So the GAN61, which is the very downstream inhibitor, could reverse the EMT that's induced. So this is the EMT in the presence of 6-1. You lose EK adherin. It's just one thing we checked. Um, and then when you add GAN61, you can gain that back. Okay. And again, cyclopamine did not inhibit all these aggressive phenotypes across all systems. And you wouldn't expect it to because in some systems we didn't have, we weren't working through canonical activation. So the ligands weren't requ required for activation of glee, and neither is smoothened, is what that's telling you. All right, so what does this mean in vivo? So what we did is we did an experiment where we labeled the non-EMT cells, in this case we took the MCF7 cells, um, with luciferase, and we labeled the EMT cells, so the ones expressing 6-1, with RFP, and we then mixed them and asked in vivo what happens when you do this, because what you can do in vivo then is trace the luciferase and the RFP separately. So you can tell whether the co-injection of these cells is actually inducing metastasis of the non-metastatic cells. And so, um, so we did, obviously, we controlled this so that in, our, in this setting, we injected our control luciferase versus untagged, our control RFP versus untagged, and then the two mixed together. We did a one-to-one -one ratio in our first experiment just to try to, um, just to use a lot of cells so hopefully we'd see a difference. And hopefully what you can appreciate, but maybe it's better here, this is looking only at luminescence signals, so that means we're, t we're only following the progression of the non, so-called non-metastatic cells. And when you co-inject them with the, the cells that are expressing 6-1 and they are actually intrinsically more metastatic, you can see that you have um, an increase in luciferase signal, suggesting that you've got increased metastasis of the non-metastatic cells. Um, so then we asked, well, okay, so can we inhibit this process from happening, the crosstalk, using GANT61, so this inhibitor of glee? Um, and this is an experiment where we did the exact same thing. We did the co-injections, and then we randomized our groups. 
We gave um, one group a vehicle, obviously, one group um, GANT61, and we had our control group that shouldn't metastasize very efficiently, and it's all quantitated up here. And um, again, now we're following only the luciferase tag cells. And what you see is that if you add GANT61, we affected not only the growth of the non-metastatic cells at the primary site, but we also affected their ability to metastasize at the secondary site. So interestingly, um, we also followed RFP signal, and I'm not going to show all this data, but RFP, so the, the, the signal from the metastatic cells, was far less affected by the GANT61 treatment than the, not, the signal from the so-called non-metastatic cells, which suggested to us there was, there was actually, there was no effect on primary tumor growth, there was a little bit of an effect on metastasis, and what that suggested to us is that the cells that have undergone an EMT are actually themselves more difficult to target, even though they do have Glee signaling activated, I should say, they have other pathways that are making them more aggressive that we'd need to target in, in addition. So if you use GANT61 clinically, you wouldn't hit those cells as well as you would hit the cells that are receiving the signal from the other cells. And I'll get back to that when I, when I start talking about some of our drug development work. <clears throat> okay, so um, one of the thought we had was, does this matter to women who actually have breast cancer? So cyclopamine derivatives are in clinical trials. They've been in clinical trials for a number of different tumor types in which there are actually mutations found in patch or activating mutations in smoothened. They've also been in clinical trials for a number of different solid tumors that are known to have activated hedgehog signaling, but don't have clear mutations in the pathway. And they've been very ineffective in that context. Um, and so one of the things we thought is that perhaps they've been ineffective in that context because if you've got a more mesenchymal cell in some of these epithelial tum tumors at least, that's um, somehow activating in a non-canonical way glee, that that wouldn't be, this axis wouldn't be targeted by those inhibitors. And so adding an inhibitor like a cyclopamine derivative wouldn't really have an effect. So um, in contrast, if you added a very downstream inhibitor, which hasn't been tried as much in clinical trials, then maybe this would have a better effect in shrinking the tumor because it would inhibit some of this crosstalk. <clears throat> so what we did was we first looked in um, human databases. Many of you who work in breast cancer know that there are lots of data sets that you can mine for breast cancer. And what we found was that um, all three of the EMT transcription factors we had been working with in numerous different data sets, highly correlated with glee expression. Remember that glee is, turns itself on. So it, you can use it as a signal for the activation of the pathway. But none of the EMT transcription factors correlated, at least not very frequently, with the ligands themselves. Again, suggesting that somehow in most cases in human breast cancer, they're actually activating this pathway in a non-canonical way. All right. Um, so again, we got together with Mike Lewis at Baylor College of Medicine, who had performed RNA-seq analysis on a huge number of breast cancer patient-derived xenografts. And we, looked, we saw a similar trend, whereas if we, if we um, how do I say this, if we displayed these as having the highest transcription factor of these three transcription factors, sort of a composite, what you see is that that N tends to correlate with higher glee signaling, but not necessarily with higher um, ligands. So again, in the PDX models, it suggested that somehow EMT activators may be affecting the signaling pathway without going through the ligands. So we took a couple of these PDX models and tested our hypothesis. And what our hypothesis would be is that these um, PDXs would respond to inhibition by GANT61, so the GLEE, the downstream inhibitor, but not respond as well to a smoothened inhibitor, which was more upstream. And so Mike Lewis did this uh, work, and what you can see is that in his PDX models, and actually he was uh, studying tumor doubling, so this isn't actually looking at metastasis, but still what we see is that in the presence of the smoothened inhibitor, we had very little effect um, on the doubling of these tumors, but that the GANT61 or the GLEE inhibitor was much more efficacious. Um, so what I will say about that is the problem with that study is you really can't say that's all because of tumor crosstalk because the GANT61 is going to inhibit the crosstalk of the tumor cells with anything in the microenvironment also, right? 
And so it's possible that the more dramatic effects are because of the microenvironmental effects, but it's something we're still trying to tease out. Um, in any case, hopefully from this part of the talk, what I um, hopefully conveyed is that, that EMT can influence tumor progression uh, through means that are not necessarily cell autonomous. So when some of these studies are done earlier that fate map, perhaps they were missing things or not looking at things in a way that was in a more non-cell autonomous fashion. So what we would argue is that if we could find ways to inhibit the ability of EMT to influence the neighboring cells, as well as to find ways to target the EMT itself in those cells. And the reason I say that is remember that I said that the cells that were EMT were not affected as much by targeting the crosstalk. If we could find some way to inhibit the transcription factors themselves directly that are inducing the EMT, theoretically we should be able to target the tumor cell as well as its effects on the neighboring cells. Okay. So that's where I'm going to get into um, some of the work that Ray and I have been doing for a number of years in collaboration with this group at ASTAR, as well as another group at um, the National Chemical Genomics Center at NIH. Um, and so we started thinking about how can we target 6-1 directly. So 6-1 is, um, I, I said earlier, it has a homeo domain, which is a DNA binding domain, and a 6 domain through which it interacts with its transcriptional cofactor called I's absent or IA. So you can imagine from the name that this is a protein that is critical for eye development in flies. If you knock it out in the, in the fly eye, you're going to lose the eye altogether. If you express it along with some of its cofactors um, in the wings or the legs of the fly, you can get a topic eye formation. So it's really critical for that. Um, and so it absolutely requires this to act. Um, and if you look at how it works, then it almost works as a bipartite transcription factor. So 6-1 is the DNA binding domain of this transcription factor, and the eyes absent genes are the transcriptional activation domain. And they're what pull in um, cofactors as well as ultimately polymerase II to activate transcription. And similarly to the sixes, most of the IAs are, are downregulated after development is complete. They're associated with the same diseases that the sixes are. And you can imagine that's true because they act together. So you can have mutations in either one or the other, and you're going to have the same phenotypes developmentally. Um, and they're also altered in cancers, so similar to sixes. All right. So what we found a few years ago is that um, if you look again, so this is an older data set now. I should probably go back and do this in some of the bigger data sets. But this is about, I think, 300 breast cancer patients from the Vandiver data set. And if we look at um, Kaplan-Meier curves for probability of being metastasis-free, uh, relapse-free, or cancer-specific survival, what we could see is if we had looked at tumors and we segregated them for high 6-1 expression with very low IA, or for high IA expression with very low 6, there wasn't any difference for any of these parameters. But when we segregate them for high 6-1 and high IA, in this case we're looking at IA2, but this works for other IAs, um, what we can see is that the time to metastasis, the time to relapse, and the cancer-specific survival dramatically decrease if you express both proteins highly. And so what that um, suggested to us is similar to what you see developmentally. In cancers, these two proteins need to work together. And so maybe utilizing that information, we can find a way to target a transcription factor. All right. And so I'm sure many of you appreciate that transcription factors are hard to target. Um, and so we thought about a couple of different ways. So when Ray, Ray and I started talking about this, um, I actually think it was Ray's idea. I don't think this is my idea. But anyway, <laughs> it's a good idea. But anyway, when Ray and I started to talk about this, we first thought, ah, oh, what about targeting the 6-DNA interaction? And then we thought, well, that will never work because um, if we tried doing that, we would inhibit probably a lot of homeoproteins because they have very conserved DNA binding domains, and that would be a big problem. So we said, forget that. That's not going to work. Um, and what I'm going to tell you about first is actually this third way we thought about, um, because that's what we've been doing in collaboration quite a bit. Started out with NIH, but now has gone much more to collaborating with this group in Singapore at ASTAR. Um, and that is to see if we can use a, an intrinsic enzymatic activity of the IA cofactor in order to inhibit the function of this complex. So I'll just quickly tell you that um, IA is not only a transcriptional cofactor, so that's been known for some time that in the C-terminal domain, which is the domain through which it binds to 6-1, <coughs> 
It actually has a unique um, had family tyrosine phosphatase activity, which, which is actually somewhat different than most tyrosine phosphatases in that it uses an aspartic acid in the active site rather than the more commonly used cysteine. So we thought it might look en different enough from other tyrosine phosphatases to target. Additionally, this phosphatase activity has been shown to play a role in 6-1 mediated transcription. And since we knew the two proteins acted together, we thought maybe if we um, targeted the phosphatase activity that we could inhibit transcription media by 6-1 and therefore um, inhibit tumor progression. I will say, since that Nature paper many years ago, we can't really show that it affects a lot of transcription. So I think it has different effects, um, and that's still something we're trying to figure out. Nonetheless, another group, uh, Rashmi Hegde's group that's at Cincinnati, showed um, around the same time we were thinking about this, that if you knock down IA in a, this is an experimental metastasis assay, you can reduce metastasis significantly. And if you add back wild type IA, you can restore it. But if you add back an IA that's phosphatase dead, so this is a, a mutation in the active site of IA, you cannot restore metastasis. So that, again, suggested that the phosphatase activity of IA would be important to target. Um, <clears throat> additionally, a paper came out in Nature a few years ago that showed that the IA phosphatase is really critical for the DNA damage response. And so what it does is, in response to DNA damage, it dephosphorylates a specific residue on H2AX, which then cell sends cells down a repair and survival pathway as opposed to having cells die in response to this damage. So what that suggested to us was if we inhibited the phosphatase activity, maybe we could actually add that along with commonly used DNA damage agent, agents or chemo, um, and that would actually decrease the ability of chemo you can use, although a lot of clinicians tell me that will never work because no one will ever test that clinically. But anyway, um, you could decrease the amount of uh, chemo you use and combine that with, um, with IA inhibition. So we've tested this, and um, this was actually not done in a breast cancer model. This was done in a UE sarcoma model um, by Tyler Robin, a previous graduate student. And what he showed is that if he knocked down IA, even if he didn't knock it down that efficiently, um, in response to different chemos, atopicide or doxorubicin, he could actually uh, make these cells much more sensitive to those compounds. And so again, that suggested to us that this is probably a worthwhile target to go after. All right. So um, Aaron Kruger in Ray Zhao's lab set up a high-throughput assay in order to specifically identify small molecule inhibitors that could target the IA tyrosine phosphatase. And he did that. It's a really simple assay, actually. It's all in a test tube. So he purified the IA domain of IA2, which has the enzymatic activity. So it's a tyrosine phosphatase domain. And if you put that in a test tube along with OMFP, it actually um, dephosphorylates this molecule and, and makes a molecule that releases fluorescence. And so this is an easy way to screen, in a high-throughput way, libraries of compounds in order to come up with small molecule inhibitors. And this just shows that he developed this assay in a high-throughput way that had very um, high signal to noise, so there wasn't a lot of background. Um, so it would be good for that kind of an experiment. Um, and what we then did was we actually wrote a grant to the NIH. I don't know if they still have these. I don't, do you know if they still have these? It was a high, it was a grant specifically to ask the NIH to do the high throughput screening. So we wrote the grant because we didn't have a facility here that could do it. And then they, we got the grant and then what they did was miniaturize our assay and do a high throughput screen where they screened about more than 300, I think it was like 370,000 compounds to find inhibitors of the IA tyrosine phosphatase. Um, and so you might appreciate from looking at these structures that we, so these are all the hits we got, and the hits were all in the same chemical class. And I thought that was awesome, because I was like, these have to be real, they're all in the same chemical class, they look structurally similar. Uh, what I now realize, and I'll, I'll tell you guys about this in a minute, is that it's not so great if you don't have hits from other classes in case the particular chemical class isn't a really good drug-like molecule, right? So in case it has problems in vivo, which we'll talk about. Nonetheless, um, Aaron tested it to see how specific it was. So one of the um, biggest problems with phosphatase inhibition, and the reason I think way more kinase inhibitors are out there than phosphatase inhibitors, is that phosphatases are notoriously uh, dirty drugs. So if you come up with a phosphatase inhibitor, they tend to inhibit all phosphatases because the phosphatase has shallow binding pockets and they're really not that unique. 
And so what Aaron tested was he tested our phosphatase inhibitor against a number of different um, phosphatases, and it doesn't really matter what they are, but in all cases, it didn't work to inhibit any of them. Um, and then, he t then the surprise came. He tested the inhibitor against other IA family members. So, um, and then Lingdi in, in Ray's lab has recently tested against IAs 1 and 4. Aaron originally tested against IA 3. But what we can see is you get nice inhibition um, of, this is just measuring our enzymatic activity of the IA 2 IA domain in the presence of this compound, yet it doesn't inhibit IA 3 at all. It also didn't inhibit IA 4 or IA 1. And to us, this was a huge surprise because the active sites of the different IAs are pretty highly conserved. And we expected to come up with an inhibitor that would inhibit all the IAs. Um, and so we're pretty puzzled by this. And Ray's lab actually did a lot of really nice biochemical analysis and mutagenesis analysis to show that the inhibitor was actually acting in an allosteric mechanism or through an allosteric mechanism. And then our, the group that we collaborate with at ASTAR in Singapore, ooh, it didn't go forward, actually recently solved the crystal structure of the, the compound bound to IA. And so they confirmed what we thought, and that is that this inhibitor is acting in an allosteric way. So it's actually binding. So I'm never going to explain the structure as well as Ray would. But um, the, I believe the wheat, as they call it, color is the, um, the, aya, the, the inhibitor bound aya, and the blue or the purplish one is unbound aya, and the unbound, uninhibitor bound. So what happens is the inhibitor bound aya, when it's bound to the compound, it actually doesn't have any magnesium in it. And magnesium is required in the active site of this um, enzyme in order to act. And so what um, they've shown at ASTAR is that when the inhibitor binds, it actually creates a larger groove in the sort of the back side. And Ray, if I'm saying this wrong, you can correct me. Uh, <laughs> sort of the back side of the molecule that pushes, that creates a, a bigger pocket than normally exists there. And that pocket then interferes with magnesium binding on the enzyme, and therefore the enzyme can't act. And, and so um, it actually is extremely specific, uh, works, um, oh, I think I actually have slides of this. Um, and so we, it's, it looks ex extremely specific, so we wanted to test whether it's really just, it's on target in cells. Um, and instead of doing breast cancer to look at this, we decided to check if it's on target in ovarian cancer. Um, and the reason for that is that um, there are papers out there that show that IA is overexpressed in as many as 94% of ovarian cancers, IA2 specifically, right? We needed to find a cancer that was IA2 dependent. Um, and that about 15% of ovarian cancers have IA2 amplified. And so the slide is a little busy, I apologize. Um, but so what we did is we decided to test, to, to do, um, a set of genetic experiments to see if this compound is on target. And the way we did that is we first took a ovarian cancer cell line that we found, we screened a whole bunch of ovarian lines, um, and we either, we found one line that didn't express IA endogenously, uh, but it does express 6-1, and then we added back either wild-type IA or a mutant of IA that's tyrosine phosphatase dead, and then we asked what are the phenotypes influenced by that tyrosine phosphatase activity. And what we could show, and again, because I'm kind of running low on time, um, and I don't want to run through every single piece of data, but what we could show is that as previously reported, IAs definitely activate growth. That's shown here by Incusite. Um, but they're not dependent on the activation of growth. They're not dependent on the phosphatase activity because the mutant activates growth just as well as the wild type, right? And I don't have to go through all of this, but the same is true of death. What ends up happening is Wild type IA protects cells from death, uh, and the mutant protects them just as well. So, so the tyrosine phosphatase activity is not important for growth mediated by IA2. But what it is important for is migration and, and invasion mediated by IA2. So if you do look at those mutations with respect to, sorry, over here, this is a scratch assay. Wild type IA dramatically inhibits, or sorry, enhances migration. The mutant of IA that's tyrosine phosphatase dead does not. Uh, this is looking at filopodia formation. Wild type IA dramatically increases the filopodia on cells. The mutant does not. And invasion, again, wild type IA dramatically um, increases um, invasion, whereas the mutant of IA does not. And this is all work done by Hungbo Zhao um, in the lab um, very recently. 
All right, so if we want to use this system to see if our compound is on target, what we'd expect to happen is if we add the compound and it really targets just the tyrosine phosphatase, we should affect migration and invasion and filopodia formation, but we should not affect growth in any way or cell death. And that's exactly what we saw. Um, so, so what we could show is that, um, again, growth, I'm not going to go through every piece of this data, but if we use our novel inhibitor, uh, growth is not affected, nor is cell death. But the inhibitor affects migration mediated by AYA, uh, invadopodia formation mediated by AYA, as well as um, invasion mediated by AYA. So to us, that suggests that we have a really nice research tool, really, uh, to study the AYA tyrosine phosphatase function. Um, we know how it acts. Uh, we have a lot of good data with this. The caveat is that, um, like I said to begin with, this is not a very good chemical backbone. And the um, PK properties of this compound are really bad. Uh, Half-life is really short. There's um, data out there that suggests toxicity. And so we haven't been able to take this small molecule in vivo into animals, um, which has been somewhat disappointing. But the group at ASTAR, who have amazing medicinal chemists, have been working on trying to alter the structure, now based on a lot of structural activity relationships that they can look at, in order to make the compound so that it doesn't have the toxicity and doesn't have the bad properties, but actually um, is more potent. And so we're still waiting to see where that goes um, and, and uh, whether we can actually take this from being more of a research tool into an, a more in vivo setting. Okay. So in the last couple minutes, I'm going to tell you a quick story about inhibiting the interaction. Um, so this one was also done in collaboration with uh, NCGC, um, ASTAR. So there are a lot of interesting IP issues around this kind of thing when you do it, and ASTAR and NIH haven't reached an agreement, so we kind of have to work separately with them, which is a bit hard. But anyway, um, they can reach an agreement, but it might take a while. But anyway, what we showed is that if you make a mutation of 6-1 that can't bind to AYA, that mutation can inhibit metastasis, and that's quantitated here when compared to wild-type IA. This is a DNA binding mutant, so we, that was essentially a positive control. And I should say that these mutations are naturally occurring in genetic syndromes, so we just characterized a number of mutations that are naturally occurring and found one that disrupts binding to IA um, that we could use to genetically prove that the interaction is important. Um, and so around that same time, Ray's group actually solved the crystal structure of 6-1 bound to IA. And what was really satisfying about that structure was that this particular residue that's mutated in this genetic syndrome was actually sitting right in the interface between IA, sorry, between 6, this is an alpha helix of 6-1, and a hydrophobic groove in IA. So what that suggested to us is if you can disrupt a single amino acid and disrupt metastasis and break up this interaction, that perhaps we could get small molecules that go um, here to disrupt the interaction between these two proteins. All right. So interestingly, the inter... Oops, sorry. Um, why is it not? There we go. The interaction looks like a, a number of other um, targeted interactions that we currently have small molecules that can disrupt it. So we thought, okay, this is probably worth giving a try. And because I want to have a few minutes left for... Um, questions. I'm just going to go through this rather quickly. But we did the same kind of thing here. Uh, Ray's lab, with the help of Melanie Blevins, who's a student, uh, was a graduate student in her lab, developed a high throughput screen that was, again, a, a totally an in vitro screen to look at the interaction between these two proteins. And this just is a, a shows that it works, essentially. And we then did a high throughput screen of many different compounds, again, 370,000 compounds, again, with the help of the NIH. And we identified a number of different clusters that appeared to break up the interaction, um, including this is, a, this is actually luciferase assay from a, report, a, a promoter that's responsive to 6 and IA. And so what we saw here was that um, wild type 6-1 with IA activates it. If you put in this mutant of 6-1 that can't bind to IA, it does not activate. And then we found a couple compounds, this one and, this, and let's see, which is the other one we used, this one we've used. Uh, that look like they can inhibit transcription in cells. So Hungbo has done a fair amount of work trying to characterize these. And again, because I, I want to end, I'm just going to go through this quickly. But he used proximity ligation assay. Oops. Um, he, 
to show in cells that the interaction occurs and that we can disrupt the interaction with a small molecule compound. So 7570 is a compound with the same chemical backbone that does not work in our in vitro assays to break up the interaction. So that's our control. 7572 and 8430 are the two that work. And I'm not sure how well you can see this, but the little red dots are indicative of 6 and IA interacting. Um, and you can see that this compound does not disrupt that interaction, but these two compounds actually does in, uh, disrupt the interaction in cells. And this is just quantitation of that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to skip over this just in the interest of time. Uh, we've also looked at a number of different phenotypes. So we've looked at signaling pathways downstream of 6-1, as well as phenotypes like EMT that I showed you earlier. Uh, again, if you introduce 6-1 into these cells, you get rid of epithelial e cadherin membrane staining. If you put in these two, our two lead compounds, hopefully you can appreciate that you dramatically restore the cells to a more epithelial phenotype. And so this compound also isn't great. Um, it doesn't have a great half-life, but it has more, um, the structure is such that it's more amenable to a lot of medicinal chemistry changes. And so we thought, well, let's just go ahead and try to do an in vivo experiment. And so the half-life of this compound, we did a lot of PK analysis, uh, Dan Gustafson helped us with that, is um, less, it's an hour, it's about an hour. So it's super short. So we essentially injected cells into the orthotopic site, and then three days later, we started injecting the compound near the, that site, just as proof of concept. Um, and we injected every other day for three weeks, and then we had to stop administering the compound because we ran out. But to our surprise, while there's absolutely no effect on primary tumor growth, which we actually thought it might affect, so we were surprised by that, uh, there's a pretty dramatic, I mean, there's a lot of variability in the number of mets we got, but there's a pretty dramatic effect on metastasis because these animals that got this compound, they didn't get METs at all. So we're super excited about this, but it's, to me, almost too good to be true, so we need to go back and do this again, we're in the process of doing that right now. So this is a pretty recent um, experiment that we did. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, so what are the next steps? There are a lot of next steps. Part of the reason I wanted to talk about this drug development work was, again, to hopefully um, inspire other people to get interested in doing this sort of thing around novel compounds. And if, again, if you're interested, contact me because I have the contacts at ASTAR. They vet any project that you have pretty um, significantly before they'll take it on, but they are really interested in doing this kind of thing. Um, so we have a lot of things to do uh, with the protein interaction inhibitor. We still don't know um, which protein the compound binds. And so in that case, we don't have any of that information. We obviously have to assess these compounds quite a bit more in cell culture. In vivo, we need to improve their potency and half-lives. We're working with chemists, again, at ASTAR and NIH to do this. Um, and we think ultimately, you know, you'd probably never use these alone, but maybe they could work well um, in combination with things like Gantt 61, which I talked about earlier, or DNA damaging agency. Okay, so with that, um, I didn't do any of the work in the lab, obviously. I haven't been in a lab in a long time. I wish I could be. But um, this was done, a lot of this work that I talked about today was done by a previous graduate student, Deepika Nilakantan, she's probably over here. Um, she did all, a lot of the hedgehog signaling work. Uh, some of the more recent work I showed you was done quite a bit by Hung Bo Zhao, and a number of members of Ray's lab, who's been a long-term collaborator for a long time and has been great, as well as the group at ASTAR that's actually about 20 people deep but I only um, listed the sort of the main people who we, who we communicate with a lot, um, as well as people at the NIH who have helped. And with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, Jen? Not yet, and we should, obviously. So that's on the, that's something we have to do, but we haven't yet. They've sort of been working as parallel projects separately, but obviously that's really important because we'd like to know if it inhibits the crosstalk too, right? Yeah, but, you know, there might be, yeah, other yes. projects that, that the, the things that are working inside, Yeah, and there almost surely are, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. David? I wonder if your IF phosphatase inhibitor affects the DNA damage. So 
we've tried that in breast cancer cells and have not seen a dramatic effect. I think where we have to go back to that, so, so there's a bit of a problem there in that, remember that the IA phosphatase inhibitor is very specific to IA2. And a lot of these cells where they've shown the DNA damage response have very high IA1 and IA3. And so we've not seen it in the models we've used. And the models that we can show there's a DNA damage response by IA are IA3 driven. So the fact that this turned out to be an allosteric inhibitor is pretty cool on the one hand and kind of a pain on the other because we can't necessarily test that in all models. But we should, what we need to go back to is that ovarian cancer model we just built and see whether at least in that artificial model where you've really got mostly one prevalent IA and it's IA2, whether it can work there. So, Carol? No, but I need to start doing that. <laughs> you guys are always telling me I should look at hormones, and I just, I know. Yeah, that's right. And to be honest, where we see, where, where while twist and snail are primarily expressed in um, triple negative breast cancers, 6-1 um, correlates with prognosis much better in the hormone positive cancers. So I actually think we need to do that. So if you ever want to help me play around with that sort of thing, because <laughs> I, I think that's a really important question. Kristen? Yeah. Yes. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. We thought it might be WIN. We thought it might be TGF beta signaling because that's affected by 6-1 also. Surprisingly, because both of those cross talk with Hedgehog. Surprisingly, again, it wasn't any of those. Turns out that, so DeGuang, I don't know if he's here, but a, a, a visiting student in the lab has shown that VEGFC can activate Glee signaling. So this is a totally novel mechanism of, and, and non-canonical mechanism. And he's actually done a ton of data he can, or experiments. He can show that in multiple systems, including more spontaneous models, like not these engineered ones with twist or snail or uh, VEGFC signaling can activate Glee and that that's really important for the crosstalk. So we're actually almost ready to send that paper out after we do in vivo experiments. So up here. In. For the first half talk the EMT, you mentioned that the recent papers were case mapping uh, EMT markers. Mm -hmm. Right, right. True, yeah. You would, you would think some of them would come through. And I, I guess one argument I can make for that is that when you fate map, you use one specific promoter. And you have to expect that your cells, when they become more mesenchymal, are turning on that promoter. And I don't think there's a one size fits all for EMT anyway, so I think that that's a flawed experiment from that standpoint. But the other thing I will say is that there's a fair amount of data now that the more epithelial looking cells are more capable of growing out at the secondary site. So they may all reach that site, but the ones that are more epithelial are more proliferative and therefore able to grow out better. So, so there's probably some selection for those also once they hit the secondary site. Mm -hmm. Phil? Yeah, it's a cyclopamine derivative, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what's so different about those two tumors, at least my understanding with respect to hedgehog inhibition, is that the, so first of all, the basal cells have mutations, activating mutations in that pathway, right? Um, and secondly, the pancreatic cancers have uh, a lot of stromal activation. And what's thought to happen is that hedgehog inhibition is affecting the stromal compartment. And that is feeding back on the tumor cells and doing the opposite of what you would like. So, so they are, so from a clinical standpoint, yeah, they're a little scary because there are so many cell types that use hedgehog signaling that you could have bad effects like that. And I think it's gonna be very cancer dependent, 
I mean, and maybe even within a cancer, you're going to have to figure out which ones have, for example, which ones have activated EMT pathways that might be more responsive to this, right, or something like that. So it could be pretty problematic, I agree. Any other questions? Great. Thanks, everyone.